So thank you so, so much for, um, to use a New York term, schlepping from all the way to the other side. I had problems finding this place myself, uh, which probably means I have less people. That's good. OK, so um, my name is Jacob Caspi. I'm a principal technical architect at uh, AT&T, responsible for our uh, domain 2.0 and uh, specifically our uh, cloud architecture, which uh, we have spoken about uh, at length in, uh, at, at uh, a keynote address in uh, uh, day one. Uh, so figured we'd take a little time to expand on what Saurabh said on uh, day one. And uh, if we can uh, uh, first look at, so what makes us qualifiable to actually speak here about this stuff? So, uh, you know, some statistics. Uh, we, uh, we are moving as a company to a virtual-centric or software-centric uh, uh, network, meaning virtualize our global network with target of 30% uh, to be virtualized by 2016 or this year and a goal of 75% of our network virtualized by, um, by 2020. I mean, so, so to give you an idea of what that scale means, uh, right now we are moving about 114 petabytes of data uh, per day. Uh, so virtually that, by 2016, if you do the math, that's about um, 30 to 40 petabytes per day moving through a cloud, which is a fairly impressive standard, at least you know, if, if, we, are, if we are to impress ourselves. Uh, our, uh, the name for uh, AT&T coin, coined for our cloud is called the AT&T Integrated Cloud. We had uh, several iterations early on, uh, which uh, I can go into later detail before that, uh, after this. 74% uh, uh, 74 deployments to date, meaning there are 74 data centers where, or central office or other facilities where we have our cloud deployed today. Uh, on the IT workloads, uh, we are planning to move at least 60% of our IT, uh, strategic IT application to a cloud deployment, and we are very serious about it. We're moving one application per day, and we have thousands. Uh, one of the things that uh, motivate this, of course, is, is our operational servings. We found that by moving to a uh, cloud when we could utilize, have much higher utilization of resources, we've reached as much as 50% higher efficiency. Uh, than our current dedicated boxes. Uh, of course, white box strategy. Um, we are a contributing member of the OCP, or Open Compute Projects. If anybody does not know what that is, you should definitely look that up, uh, opencompute.org. And we are to fully committed to open source. Uh, we, have, uh, we have doubled a number of uh, open source applications running on at and and for anybody from a telco, um, you should know that that's quite an achievement. So specifically to OpenStack, uh, as I've mentioned, we've deployed over 70 sites with OpenStack clouds. Uh, 57 of those are actually in production. We are connecting millions, so no, not, uh, we're not a uh, China telecom by any means, but we have uh, quite a few millions of wireless customers that we are virtualizing. Uh, uh, we are training our staff in, uh, with OpenStack. Uh, we are an early adapter. Uh, we actually started uh, deploying OpenStack in the Diablo version in 2011. And I should know because I was part of the team that actually did that. And um, a little bit of an antidote is, but when we deployed this, uh, we decided to uh, 
and and got the support of management to do it in a in a fairly um, hush way, meaning we did not publicize at at t that we we're doing this we uh, we were given a separate budget to go and do that, and basically at t incubated this idea to see where it will grow and i uh, Remember, there are people who actually knew about the project and were talking to me and telling me something like, you know, this stuff with open source and open stack, that, that, that will never work. And of course, here we are, um, it's five years later, and we have a strategy based on that. So um, don't ever discount small efforts, for sure. Uh, 15,000 VMs, thousands of nodes, uh, uh, we have found that uh, deploying uh, uh, resources on, on our clouds is definitely a lot faster than deploying it on, on bare metal servers from a, from a resource uh, allocation perspective. Uh, and that the most important thing is that the unified set of APIs that make it easy to talk to the cloud and applications on the cloud uh, uh, with regards to how to communicate and make efficiency of efficient use of the resources. So what makes Carrier different than uh, specific IT workload? And that's, that's really where it gets complicated. Uh, our, our needs beyond just uh, virtualizing and cloudifying our, our IT workloads, which most companies should, most companies should be doing, is that we are actually virtualizing a network, which is a totally different set of problems and concerns in architecture. Uh, and to give a few example of that is, uh, if you're doing just IT workloads, you can have three or four data centers so that you have diverse uh, geographical locations and you can put many servers in there and that's it. We have thousands of locations. We have central offices, we have uh, uh, head offices, we have video centers, we have, each one of them have different workloads, each one of them has different needs, each one of, the, of them have different requirements for various sizes. Uh, we come from a, uh, you can have thousands of servers in one location and maybe half a dozen in another location. And that, that diversity le leads to a architecture, how do, you, how, do you make, how do you make it all work so it all looks the same and you don't have to have customized deployment to location. Uh, again, the workloads, varies from one to the other, uh, video workloads, uh, network functions, um, there's been a lot of talk about NFEs, uh, those get complicated. Um, uh, bandwidth, again, I talked about uh, high bandwidth demand, and, and our bandwidth demand are not just east-west between applications in the data center, they are north-south, I mean, we send huge amount of data between data centers or between our data center to the cloud or data center to, to other uh, functions such as mobility centers and um, video centers, et cetera. And uh, on the SDN level, uh, layer two, layer three has pretty much been accomplished uh, by this point by several providers, but we actually need to move to the next level. We need to do re-switching, re-router, and higher packet processing uh, through, throughout the, the whole fabric. Uh, talked about the different uh, size of infrastructure um, in data centers. There's also not just uh, that the size is different, but actually that the uh, even uh, things like the power uh, consumption is different. In our data center, we have DC voltage, 48 volts DC, which um, I don't know if anybody saw in the last uh, 
in the last OCP uh, summit, uh, Google actually uh, announced that they are moving into the OCP world with a 48 volt DC power distribution, which the people at AT&T were saying, well, we've been doing this for I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, regula regulatory, we need uh, some of those locations require NEBS 3, which is a higher level standard. Um, we have some locations which are bare staffed, not full time, so if something goes wrong, we have to, you know, they are dark, we have to come back or dispatch a, a, a technician. And, uh, and the biggest thing that we see is that in a large data center, if you have thousands of nodes in, in, in properly distributed application workload, if a node fails, it's not a big deal. Application recovers, builds somewhere else, and, and you're back to your own capacity. Uh, when you have a deployment with half a dozen to a dozen servers, where each one of them serves critical functions, that becomes a lot more tricky. You can't, you can't just exhaust uh, the, the server and then come back a month later and replace the dead server. You, you really have to tend to it a lot faster. Uh, some of the things that we have uh, done to remedy this, we, we have looked at uh, multi-vendor uh, standardization uh, that where whatever vendor we buy from, it's actually the same specs, the same server. So if we, uh, if we change vendor and we do uh, um, rely on a multi-vendor strategy, so the, the server would, could come from any of the leading providers or, or white box, uh, our automation can recognize what the server is and do uh, and provision to that regardless of what it is. Uh, we have started looking at OCP and OCP inspired uh, hardware to, uh, to see what we can do to push the community to adopt the carrier, uh, more stringent carrier specs uh, beyond what Facebook and Microsoft have been doing. And uh, uh, the network also, uh, of course, does, uh, does change a bit as well. Because we are um, we're doing uh, workload not just um, moving uh, data from one point to the other, but also uh, uh, scaling out to the web and scaling up to multiple applications. Uh, we're talking about uh, multiple, multiples of petabytes or, um, it, or uh, uh, gigabits and even terabits of information going not just through the fabric internally uh, from one uh, server to the other, but actually going out to, to the white area network. Uh, to run the, the network functions, we have to do a fairly low oversubscription, so um, our, our closed fabric needs to be much, much wider than normal. Uh, uh, moving, up, moving wide area functionality such as MPLS or, uh, or others directly to the servers requires uh, more stringent uh, uh, functions on on the switch, such as um, deep, deeper buffers and uh, and more memory for uh, tables, uh, as an example. Uh, and again, the way we figured out around this it, is by treating all the sites the same. So. If we have some sites that don't require all that functionality, we still deploy the same type of, of, of hardware on all of the sites. So in theory, all sites can handle all functionality and all sites look the same. Uh, again, going back to a little bit of history. So Claus Fabric, which is uh, the standard deployment of uh, uh, and most cloud applications uh, 
uh, was actually invented at AT and T in in the 1940s. So it's it's sort of interesting to see how this this uh, topology that is now so ubiquitous across all the web scale is is actually something that you know, our folks thought about quite a while ago, and they didn't even know what Ethernet was at the time. Uh, trying to self simplify the hardware layer of the infrastructure with a uh, with separating from uh, the overlay from the underlay, and uh, we've had several announcements in the in the um, in the press about that. For example, uh, a few months ago, we have announced that we are using Open Contrail to uh, as an SDN controller for our um, for our network, uh, which will allow us to do more complicated functions that that currently is, are not available in, uh, in Neutron. Uh, and the most important thing that we are, we have learned through this is is, is this is that m most clouds are local and they get attached to the wide area network. Our clouds are virtualizing the air the, the wide area network, which is a totally different thinking about what the cloud does. It's not just to uh, process data or process, you know, do, you know, map reduce or, uh, um, uh, or calculate the payroll. It's actually m virtualizing how packets move throughout uh, the wide area network. Uh, we talked about diversity of the network. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, about the, the the bandwidth, and the other important thing that we have to uh, co we have to consider at our scale or at that uh, from carrier is uh, that we're not just connecting to the to uh, to the internet or maybe a couple of data centers to each other. We actually are making point-to-point -point connections from one functionality of our, of our infrastructure to another. So for example, from video to, to data center, from uh, meaning from IT, from mobility to our edge points, et cetera. The other, um, the other bigger, big difference that we see is a customer. Our customers could be anything from uh, either IT workloads or even you know some SL users that needs to to upgrade the operating system on their on their machine. Uh, overlay perspective, uh, moving from basic layer two, layer three with the GRE or VXLAND to uh, to MPLS over GRE, uh, the transport layer, um, IP version six is critical to us. We can't do anything with IP version, uh, just IP version four. And uh, looking at the uh, Google statistics, I think the last time I saw is maybe about somewhere between 10 to 15% of Google traffic is IPv4 um, or uh, six. 100% of our traffic must be IPv6. So we can't make any compromises on that. Um, network services, uh, I mentioned before, is beyond just the bandwidth. We have uh, to provide, uh, uh, to accommodate network function visualization, which actually uh, provide services across the, the wide area network. So an example, um, a network on demand product, you can actually service change a load balancer and a, um, and a firewall right through a portal uh, running on, on, this, on this cloud. So you not only determine how much bandwidth do you need, is you can actually say, okay, in addition to that bandwidth, I want you to add uh, a firewall to this. And the cloud, act our cloud actually has been configured to make that happen. Um, again, routing and switching uh, can't just do 
standard vSwitch. It doesn't have enough, enough uh, capacity to do that. We actually have to do uh, integrate the routing and the bridging right in the v router. Uh, locally distributed. Uh, one of the ways to make OpenStack thin is actually distribute uh, as much of the control plane as you can to, to uh, centralized locations and then get them to be thin in, in the areas where you, um, where you have limited uh, capacity for, for hardware. And then of course, you also have to remember on in the big data centers where you have you know, thousands of VMs running, you still have to have enough scale out capacity so you can get to the number of servers that you need at, at, that, uh, at that layer. Um, none of this will be possible without automation. Again, the first 50 percent of efficiency has been uh, would not have been able to be achieved if we didn't automate anything uh, or everything. The, uh, have you seen, if you've seen Saurabh's presentation uh, on um, uh, yesterday, he uh, introduced an example of a tool that we have developed that allow us to say, here is X number of racks, here is the capacity we need, go build it. And that tool actually creates rack elevation, assign IP addresses, creates the, the uh, hooks to a uh, automation schools, the tools such as fuel, and allow fuel to then automatically provisions all the servers from bare metal to an open stack node. And that has been a tremendous savings when, uh, from a, a um, from a labor perspective, if you want to do 74 sites, like as we did last year, and plan to do it across hundreds, if not even thousands. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've been using op uh, OpenSec and Fuel uh, and have been contributing to it uh, in, a, uh, in the last year to make, to make this automation go. And, uh, and of course, transforming the organization from a uh, standard waterfall environment to a true, um, a true uh, DevOps model that allows the CI/CD and allows us to uh, actually upgrade on a regular basis, so we don't have to uh, we don't have to be stuck with a, an earlier versions and. Um, and sm smooth uh, move from one from one version to the other. So, um, you know, we started a little later, so late, and I wanted to leave some time for questions. So, uh, just to summarize, um, again, diverse workloads: web, big data, analytics, network functions, voice, video. They all are different, and they all have to be treated different, but they all need to run on the same, on the same cloud. Uh, and that's the only way that we found that we can actually make it scale enough to, to be efficient. Uh, Multi-vendor standards, uh, all servers have to be the same, regardless of where you get them for. Uh, we see OCP as an important uh, function uh, it has been solely uh, focused on, on IT workloads or Facebook or, or even Microsoft, uh, but we are pushing very hard to make it a, a community that will do a much more uh, focused effort towards uh, carrier uh, needs, which I mentioned as before are, are more stringent. Um, on the network underlay, we made a tremendous effort to move to 100% merchant silicon switches so we can basically change vendors in the same way uh, that we are changing on the servers. As long as the switch functionality is the same, it doesn't really matter where we get it from. Uh, network overlay, basically 
again, virtualizing the wide area network. So uh, getting, getting wide area network functionality directly to the server is critical. And orchestration uh, scale, from centralized to uh, controlling small locations to um, scale out deployments in, in the large data centers. And finally, most, three most important things about automation is just, just do it. Automate, automate, automate. Okay, with that, I'll take some questions. Okay. No, so the, 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 the scale, I, I wasn't saying that they are virtualized. What I was saying is that that's the subscriber level that we have. So I, are those subscribers uh, a part of uh, virtualized those, The services to those subscri subscribers will be a part of our virtualized network, yes. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Can, actually, can you guys use the microphone since we are uh, recording this? Um, and and there's a cue. <laughs> uh, no, the question was, uh, what network elements of the wireless network are virtualized? So uh, at this point, it's the control element. I really the can't. Uh, I really can't go into. A detail what specific network function does okay. or, what, or what part of it is virtualized or not. It's okay, but the plan is to virtualize all those network elements, right? Like the MME, probably the controller and... 75% yes. is users. our target, yes. Right, okay. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, can you disclose which uh, network OS you're using on the Merchant Silicon switches? Uh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> If I ask you privately, can you? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it, it will leak out. Yes, um, it, it will. I mean, our, our, our compatriots at the Verizon just released what they're doing. Um, we are not at the stage where we are, uh, okay. we are at liberty to do that. Um, a similar question to that. Can you disclose uh, if you're using a particular uh, OpenStack distribution or using uh, your own? Or you uh, so we are using um, a, 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 we are using the standard distribution uh, right out of uh, uh, Trunk. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, could you go into any more detail on? Uh, you know, the virtualizing the WAN and the cloud, you know, the transition between the like neutron powered, more local networks and how that transitions do you encapsulate before you send it over IPv6 or just talking about that a little more detail. So we have several sessions that will go into detail on that and I sort of rather not, not take the time to, to uh, get into details in this discussion. Uh, but if you do, we have several, several discussions throughout the day that, uh, throughout the, the summit that actually will go into detail into that. Sorry. On the previous slide, you had a contributing to fuel. Can you say where that fits into the strategy or what it's used for? If so you're using a standard OpenStack distribution. So uh, fuel is an open source, um, uh, is an open source uh, tool. You can use it with um, uh, Mirantis operating with the Mirantis OpenStack. You can use it with uh, uh, with standard di distribution. It's not a uh, uh, it's not specifically to Moz, although we are working with Mirantis. Yes, sir. For your larger data centers, what has been the impact on your operational staff, both in terms of numbers and the level of training required? Uh, I don't have numbers in terms of staff, but uh, I do know that um, we are, uh, anybody in them that is part of the ATT domain 2.0 is required 
to take uh, training courses on OpenStack and cloud. Uh, we have courses that we offered uh, from AT&T University, and we have courses that we have partnered with uh, other leading universities to provide, as well as running our own, um, our own courses. So uh, this is a, and there's been a New York Times article about that. I mean, AT&T has made an immense effort into retraining our staff f with, um, with the next generation architecture and moving people from, you know, making sure that our, our, our workforce is ready for the next generation of, of technology. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, you have many, many uh, OpenStack clouds. Most yeah. probably those are uh, separated. But uh, the services running on that cloud, okay, the service needs to run across the cloud. So I guess so you have some uh, orchestration or management software on top of that. So uh, could you explain a bit about that? Right. So, um we have developed what we call the service orchestration layer, which uh, is, I only, uh, the, I know the acronyms, and somebody at the audience may help me what that is. It's called ECOMP. It's enhanced control and right, policy, right. So, um, and actually I believe there's also a session about that that we have developed internally and actually considering open sourcing that, that, that orchestrate across the data centers and orchestrate the function, the various functions uh, on top, running on top of uh, OpenStack. So if you think as OpenStack for us is the infrastructure as a service orchestration, uh, Ecomp is the, um, is the service orchestration layer on top of that that uh, does management in terms of location distribution and service, services, et cetera. Thank you. I have uh, <clears throat> probably what's considered a non-sexy question, right? Okay. So it's more about IPAM, IP address management. So from your slides, I understand at least for the under cloud or the OpenStack components, you know, you could be using any variety of, you know, open source or, you know, vendor specific IPAM software. How are you handling the overlay or the NFV type function, IPAM management, where you know encapsulations, tunnels, destinations, subnet siders might get assigned, you know, um, you know, not randomly, but on demand, be torn up, torn down. How are you handling that uh, type of auditing and and control? And are you integrating that into the same tool as your your under cloud or your OpenStack components, or using a separate one? So to answer the last question, yes, we are integrated. It um, uh, from um, how we're doing this, uh, we are actually using uh, Open Contrail to uh, manage IP distribution and um, uh, and uh, service changing, chaining, and uh, uh, and MPLS management. Okay, so all your, all your, pretty much your NFV overlay type IPAM is outsourced basically to the, the network controller versus OpenStack or some. Exactly, okay. exactly. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so you talked about network on demand, uh, sorry, bandwidth on demand and uh, the ability to service chain a load balancer and a firewall. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in your experience, uh, how many times has it been requested? And also, uh, you know, provisioning a simple service chain is okay. You know, uh, in terms of actually scaling it up, like for example, you scale up the load balancer and then actually the scale the firewall in accordance with that. Do you give templates so so that people can lay out their own topology, or uh, what is the way you actually deliver this particular service? So network in demand is an AT and C service. It hasn't been uh, rolled out in a wide fashion. I, I don't know how many sites, how many customers we actually have on it, but it basically, uh, the customers have a portal where they can uh, assign, uh, let's say they have a 10 gig pipe, but they only need, on a regular basis, they only need, I don't know, one gig. 
so they can dynamically change the amount of bandwidth that, um, that comes to their premises. Now, in the past, we used to have a customer premises equipment. So if they wanted a firewall or if they wanted a load balancer, they would basically uh, buy more hardware. Uh, the way we're doing this now is through that portal is they can add that, uh, that functionality to, to their services, but virtually, virtually, so they don't have to have anything any, any uh, premises, uh, any hardware on the premises. Uh, so, so it's a simple service chain, not uh, yes. something like a, you know, a data center where you need to scale it out. Yes, so that's a scale out data center is, is, a, is a totally different, okay. uh, different deployment type. Yes. But again, uh, m the movement is from dedicated hardware for load balancing and, and firewalling to scale out, uh, scale out functionality, so virtual load balancer, virtual firewall, so you don't have to have all these big, big pieces of equipment there sitting there. Okay, man, we are right on time. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and finding this, uh, play, this uh, ballroom and, uh, and um, enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>